Khan. My name is Melissa. I'm an alcoholic. Um, yeah, so I have been nervous all day about this, and I'm just trying to leave in God's hands. Um, now, there is one thing I, I have to read, and that is I'm supposed to explain what we were like, or wait, hang on. What we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. Um, before I was introduced to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I was um, a wild card. Um, I know my childhood was not very fun. Um, I remember being very isolated before I was in fifth grade. Um, I didn't have any friends. Uh, I was I was the kid on the playground that got talked about by everybody. Like nobody played with me. Um, at home, I had a physically abusive father and an emotionally unavailable mother. Um, and I just I, I couldn't connect with people because I mean I didn't know how to connect. My parents didn't connect with me, so connecting was not something I could do. Um, as I got older, the feeling kind of grew and I just, I stayed to myself and I learned to be okay with who I was. Um, little did I know that I was not okay with myself. I was actually lying to myself. Um, I didn't know that until later on in life. Uh, I took my first alcoholic drink when I was 15 years old. I can remember it vividly, even today. Um, I was, I want to say Horn Lake area. I was just inside Mississippi and I was by a creek and it was the middle of the day and it was very pretty. Um, and I was with my sister, my cousin, and my cousin's boyfriend. And they were drinking and they asked if I wanted one. And I was like, you know what? Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll try one. And uh, I did not expect what happened. I did not like the taste. Couldn't stand it. It was disgusting. But once that feeling hit, I was in awe. Um, it talks about how you know we felt that first feeling, and that was it. That was our aha moment, um, and that was mine. Um, and I knew that. In that moment, I could be who I wanted to be, say what I wanted to say, think what I wanted to think, and not have to worry about what everybody else thought of me. I was more worried about what y'all thought of me, even though I was hiding it. Um, I was more worried about everybody's thoughts of me, and in that moment of alcohol, like I didn't care anymore. I was just okay. I was happy. Um, and then, as I... Um, got a little bit older. I think I was 16. Um, my dad was real sick. And we knew he was going to pass. Um, and he did. And he passed uh, just after I turned 17. And uh, I went to a friend's house and I wanted to, to check out. And that's when I found pot. Um, and I was, I was drinking every night I was smoking as much as I could um, and I did this for probably about a month um, and then my mother got wind of the fact that I was smoking and I was drinking and she was like oh no and uh, my mother came and picked me up at 11 30 and p.m. we lived far out in Mississippi and she came to Millington to get me had she not, I think I would have started my drinking career then. Um, I was blessed not to have. Uh, but I kind of wish sometimes I had because I would have been in drink a lot sooner and I wouldn't have gone through some of the things that I've been through. Um, I feel in my head. But um, it was probably in my 20s. I got to the point where I could drink and be okay, but mentally, I was checked out. Um, I was very selfish, I was very self-centered, didn't know it, didn't care, 
Um, I was going to do what I wanted to do, when I wanted to do it, how I wanted to do it. Um, and didn't, it didn't matter who it affected. And uh, um, eventually, um, I started drinking on occasion. I, I could go, I want to say about six months before I would drink again. But the moment I would pick up that drink, um, the first drink, the moment I would pick it up, I wouldn't put it down until I couldn't put any more in my body. Um, I wasn't technically a blackout drinker because I wouldn't black out. I was one of the unfortunates that would remember everything she did the next morning um, and feel all kinds of shame and guilt and um, hatred towards myself. Um, I couldn't look myself in the mirror. And uh, yeah, I would try and I would stay away from alcohol for a little bit longer and then I'd go back to it knowing what was going to happen. Um, I remember specifically one time I was at the casinos one night, and uh, I remember this earlier today. I was at the casinos one night, and I remember um, I was getting a drink, and it was a shot. And I took that shot, and I knew before I even took the shot, I looked at the, the lady, and I said, go ahead and hand me a couple of more because this isn't going to be enough. And... Uh, by the time I left there, I was pretty messed up and I was driving. And um, thank goodness we got to where we needed to be without um, getting into an accident or getting pulled over. Um, Cause y'all, I was driving without a license too, so. Um, and I remember not too long ago, somebody in this room said, you know, when you like the taste of tequila, or not tequila, gin, when you like the taste of gin, um, you might be an alcoholic and well, that kind of checked another box off because even today I'm still learning and connecting how I am an alcoholic and uh, I like the taste of gin. <laughs> I really do. Um, well, it was in my 20s when I realized I couldn't keep a job because somebody would make me mad and I would, I would flip flop on jobs. Um, I was not a very good mother. Um, I was great at going out with friends and leaving my children at home with my mother or my sister or whoever would take care of them in that moment. Um, I was, um, I was the epitome of selfishness. And I lied to myself for a long time. Even, even coming into this room, I lied to myself for a long time, saying, I'm not a selfish person. I'm not a prideful person. I'm not, um, I'm not that person. And, uh, well, then in my early 30s, uh, I was 31 years old, um, I found out that my mother was sick. And uh, she had cancer just like my dad. And uh, I remember thinking that I did not want her to suffer like my dad did. Um, my dad went two years with cancer. My mother went three months. It was a little under three months. Um, we found out in June, and she was gone by August. And... Uh, um, she was in North Carolina, and um, I lived here, and I had my children here, and I had my life here. And I remember going up to her and telling her that I felt that it would be wise for us to be here versus in North Carolina. Um, and she understood that wholly. Um, we went there when she went to the hospice, and we left the day before she passed, and we came home. And my mother passed the day after, and uh, I remember feeling like it was un unreal um, that she was gone. I was grateful that she was no longer suffering, um, and I knew I knew that she didn't want us in North Carolina. She did not want us to drive home to Mississippi, and uh, but my my family members did not agree with that. Um, I got a nasty call the next day. Um, but um, it was two weeks after that uh, that I kind of, as I told my 
I've told many people before, uh, in a sense, I jumped off the high dive into the deep end and I touched bottom because I went from drinking alcohol and uh, smoking a little pot here and there to a very, very, very heavy drug. Um, and I'm not going to go into details about that, but um, it was, I felt alone. For the first time in my life, I felt truly and utterly alone. My mother was gone, my dad was gone, and I was so selfish. I was so in my little pity party that I did not, did not consider the fact that I was not alone. I had my son, I had my daughter, I had my sister, my brother, I had family members. Um, granted, I wasn't talking to most of those family members, but I had my kids, um, and they needed me. But I was all right here. I was the most important person in my life, and I was alone. And uh, I remember that I didn't, I didn't want to feel this way anymore, and I needed something that was going to help me stop feeling. Um, and alcohol and drugs were it. Um, when that happened, um, I went for probably about three months just with drugs and alcohol. Um, and I realized it was becoming a problem. And I needed to get out of the situation that I was in. And I was living with a, an ex at the time. Um, and I called my sister and I said, Jennifer, I need your help. I can't, I can't stay where I'm at. Um, and my sister who, um, is very selfish in her own right, <laughs> surprisingly said, Melissa, come on. And, um, she moved me from where I was living to her house. Uh, and I never thought my sister would do that, but she did. And uh, I stayed there for about three months when I was sober, didn't drink, didn't do anything, wasn't working a program, didn't know anything about AA or NA or anything. Um, I was just white knuckling it, I guess. Um, I got a job, um, eventually got a vehicle that my kids got to experience with me, my first, I'd say brand new vehicle, but you know. Um, it was the first time I'd ever done something like that. Um, I got a house, and then uh, I invited, knowingly, invited my ex-boyfriend back into the picture. That was a bad decision. I'm great at making those. Um, and then I went back out, and I stayed out until um, October of 2017. Um, and I, at the lowest in my life, I had lost everything. I had, in April, given my children away to their nana. Um, I let DHS know that I could not take care of them and that they needed to go to someone who could and who loved them enough to take care of them the way they should be taken care of. Um, that was probably the hardest thing I've ever dealt with um, because I didn't know how that was going to pan out and it was not very fun. Um, and then by July, I was homeless. Um, got to spend my first night in jail um, and I was there an entire weekend. That wasn't fun either. Um, I'd never been to jail. I was almost in a sense very sheltered in my life. Even though I had issues and troubles at home, I was extremely sheltered. So the, the life that I put myself into was something I had never dreamed of. I had never, and to this day, I have nightmares about because it was, it was pretty traumatic. Um, and then, um, I had gone to jail, and when I went to jail, I started coming to the realization that I needed, I, I needed to get out of what I was in. And um, I remember I had contacted family after getting out of jail, trying to figure out what I needed to do, and they were basically like, "Hey, you got to do it on your own." 
Um, and then one night, I was living in a house that was actually being, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Repossessed by the bank, mm -hmm. foreclosed on. And we knew it when we moved in. We knew we were not going to be there for long. Um, and uh, I remember one night waking up at a, about 4 a.m. I just woke up with somebody and they said you had to go out your stuff and you had to get out. Um, and at that point I lost all of the, the possessions that I had that were important to me. Um, I lost things that were my dad's. I lost things that were my mother's, that were my children's. Um, I was lucky that I had given my, one of my most important things, or two of my most important things to my sister a couple of days beforehand. And that was the things that I had gotten from my mother upon her passing. And um, this tote, it's gray and it's not very big, but it's got um, all of my, my children's baby stuff in it. It's got drawings and things from the hospital and stickers and you name it, that, that was important. I even have Dallas's first haircut. Um, <laughs> it's a little curl, it's so cute. Um, but I gave that to my sister knowing that I, I wouldn't know how to place to stay soon. And I didn't know when that was gonna be. Um, and when I woke up that morning, I was by myself um, and I didn't know where to go. I didn't have a friend in sight. I didn't have a family member that would help. And I was sick. I was 104 pounds. Um, and my normal weight is about 130 pounds. So I was, I was teeny tiny. I was like a skeleton. I was sick. Um, I, I, my brain wasn't even functioning right. Like I, I was so terrified to drive because I was afraid I was gonna hit something. Um, but luckily I did not. And I, the first thing I could think of was to get to the hospital um, because I had a feeling that they could help me. I didn't know what else to do. So I went to the hospital. Um, they uh, sobered me up. I was in detox for about five days. They transferred me from there to another facility. Um, and I was there for all of about one day. And I was like, I can't do this. I gotta go. So I checked myself back out. Um, never drive to a facility. It's so easy just to leave. Um, I checked myself back out and I called many people. Um, my aunt hung up on me. Uh, my cousin said, you're gonna have to do this on your own. Like, we've got children, we can't take care of you. Um, and then finally I called one person that, um, honestly, I figured it was gonna be another no. Um, but I called a friend and uh, him and his, um, his fiance at the time we're about to get married, and he was like, yeah, come on, I got a bedroom that you can sleep in. Actually, his daughter had just gone to college, and uh, he said, come on, and I've known him since I was 18, so it's been many years. Um, I get to his house, and I am there for five weeks, and in that five weeks, I messed up twice, and um, the first time I actually went and told him, I explained to him the situation, and he was the first person in AA that I ever met. He was the first person I had known that was working a program and trying to be sober. And he recommended that I um, contact uh, some people and ask for help. And I did, and I was gonna do outpatient, and then I relapsed again. And uh, after the second time, he looked at me and he said, Melissa, I love you. I do, but you can't be in this home. It is a detriment to myself and my family. Um, but you have two options. You can um, get in your car and you can go, or you can leave your stuff here and I will pr protect it. And you can, I can take you to the hospital. And, um, And I told him, I said, I, I, I'll go to the hospital because I want help. I want out of this. I don't want to do it anymore. And uh, 
I remember him telling me, you know, go, go ahead and pack some stuff for the hospital. And I did. And while I was in there, I sat down on my bed, and this is the first time I'd ever meaningfully, meaningfully prayed to my higher power. And uh, I remember that prayer. I remember the tears. I remember that I was, I was so broken, and all I could say was, God, please help me. Please help me. Um, I can't do this anymore, and I need help. Um, and then I got in the vehicle, and I went to the hospital, where I stayed for a day. And the other two facilities that I had been in, St. Francis, and I'm not sure what that second one was, they couldn't find a treatment center for me to go into. And that was the problem there. Um, I was in the state of Tennessee, and my, my insurance was in the state of Mississippi. Uh, when I went into DeSoto Baptist in the state of Mississippi, they immediately found me a detox facility um, and transferred me there the next day. I stayed in the hospital one night. I left there by Medicaid van to the detox center in Batesville, Mississippi. Um, and I was there for, I believe, six days. I think I was transferred on my seventh day. Um, but it's funny because the doctor that was in there, um, he was the doctor over the facility, he came in, I want to say the day after I got there, and I saw him and I was like, oh, I know you. And uh, he was my psych doctor that I had been seeing for well over a year. He knew what I was doing. I was actually very honest with him. Um, and uh, every time I'd go in there, he'd direct test me. And every time he'd look at me, he'd say, are you ready for some help? And of course, I was not. And I would tell him no. Well, finally, I went in there that went into detox. And he looked at me and he said, you finally made it. I'm glad you did. And uh, um, while we were doing activities, they were having meetings with all the all of the people there that was there for alcoholics and drugs. And uh, everybody was taking about 30 minutes, I guess, trying to decide what they were going to do. And um, um, my doctor, he pulled me in there with two other people, and he looked at me and he said, "Okay, Melissa, so what are we going to do?" And I said, I need treatment. I can't, I can't do this. I can't, I can't stay sober. And I'm afraid that if I go back out, um, I'm just going to end up killing myself. Um, and I didn't want that. Um, even though I did, I hated my life. And uh, he, he looked at me and he said, okay, we'll get you taken care of. Um, and it was a couple of days later that I was transferred to Tupelo uh, to uh, Life Corps. And I was, when I walked in there, I was terrified. I was terrified. I was like, okay. Um, and I believe my higher power started working in me uh, the day I said my prayer because he transferred me. He got me where I needed to be. And when I walked into the rehab, I knew that that was where I needed to be. That's where I wanted to be. Um, I mean, the people that worked there, the people that were there before me that had been there for a while, like, it felt like I actually had a family at that point. Um, and they were just new in recovery, just like me. Well, the patients, the people who were there working with us, they were addicts and alcoholics too, um, and they got me. Um, they made me feel secure and safe and, in a sense, loved. Um, and I was in there for about a week, and I realized I wanted transition. But there was a problem. Here's another God moment. Um, my stuff had gotten lost in the hospital. All of my things that I had brought, my ID, my first security card, uh, my clothes, my fact when I ended up in detox, I ended up there in um, the, the blue scrubs that they give you in the hospitals when you can't be trusted. Yeah, 
Um, Detox gave me clothes. <laughs> um, and uh, I was there for about a week and we had to contact um, my kid's grandmother who absolutely detests me and I can understand why. Um, and even though she was very angry with me, still is today, she went to the hospital and she got my things. Um, and she sent them to me. And I was able, this was after about three weeks, I was able to apply for the transition program, which would have kept me there another 60 days. Um, and I got in the last day after not the normal 30. I was there for 45 days, and then I spent another 60 days. And because there were, I didn't have the money, um, and there wasn't a room available, I believe there wasn't a room available. Um, but I know I didn't have the money yet. Um, I was able to stay in the transition program a little bit longer, so I stayed in rehab 300, or um, 110 days, 115 days. And uh, so three and a half months. Um, during the time that I was there, Transition actually paid for cataract surgery. Um, so my rehab paid for me to have eye surgery and because I couldn't see. Um, another God thing. Uh, they helped me get into the Talbot House, which was a sober living for women. Um, they helped pay. I paid part and they paid the rest. Um, like, there were a lot of things moving behind the scenes that I had no control over, but that just kind of fit together and worked. Um, and I was able to get in the Talbot House, and I stayed there for six months, five or six months. I eventually got my, myself kicked out because um, by then I was, I thought I had it, <laughs> and uh, I did not. Um, and I, I walked into the, into AA feeling alone. I walked into AA feeling, um, beaten, um, self-hatred, all of it. I couldn't stand myself. I couldn't stand to be in the same room with me. And I was stuck there in the same room with me. Um, but AA offered me something I really wanted. And uh, I remember going to meetings while in AA, or while in treatment. I remember meetings being brought into the treatment facility. Um, and that meant a lot to me. Uh, once I got six months sober, I actually participated in taking H&I meetings to people in, or in facilities. Um, I've gone to the Oxford uh, rehab in Oxford um, with another group of ladies that are in recovery. Um, I stayed in, in, in the rooms um, and then life got in the way again and I stopped coming to meetings and I stopped doing what I was supposed to do. I stopped praying. I stopped being grateful. I stopped doing everything that I was supposed to do and uh, lo and behold I went back out. It was that God for a very short time, but it was um, in June and July of uh, 20, I believe 2020, no, 2021, because Abby was already born at this point. And uh, I was having, they talk in the How It Works, how we suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders. I am one of those people. I suffer from um, persistent major depression and I have to take medicine on a regular basis and I decided well I'm well enough I don't have to take that anymore mm, nope got to take my medicine um, I found that out then um, but not only do I need that medicine I need this medicine um, and AA is the medicine that if I didn't have, I'm going to drink again. I can take my antidepressant medicines, but I'm going to drink again. I know it mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. 
um, when uh, I relapsed, I knew where I needed to be. Um, I didn't come into the rooms yet. I sobered up in August. Um, and I made my first meeting, I believe, in November of 2021. Was it 2021? Yeah, because I'm two years sober. <laughs> um, and I walked into these doors, this room, and I was terrified because I didn't know y'all. <laughs> Did not know any of y'all. And... Um, but the feeling, the feeling of walking through those doors was as if I was coming home, as if I was walking into a brother and a sister's arms, um, a father and a mother's arms. Um, matter of fact, when I walked into this building, oddly enough, it reminded me of a very special childhood memory that I had of where my dad worked. And uh, we used to go stay the night because he worked nights and days, but he worked nights at this one particular place and it smelled like this room. Um, so it was like, oh, there's daddy. Um, and it was not too long after that, I started hearing my mother's voice coming out of my mouth. And I was like, oh, there's mama. And uh, um, I think it was, January 22nd, 2022, um, my daughter walked back in the house. I hadn't seen her in four and a half years. Um, during the time that I was out there, I was told I couldn't see my kids. Um, there have been times where I could speak to them by text message, but could not voice talk with them. Um, and it was mainly my son that I could talk with. Um, I remember when I walked into AA the first time um, that there were people that were, kept saying, you know, get a lawyer, do this, do that, do this. And I just couldn't see that happening because I didn't have the money. I worked at Subway. Um, I lived in a uh, home for women. Um, and when I left there, I was living with... Um, Y'all know him, he, he visits this room occasionally, uh, Eric Woody, um, who is currently my hus husband. But everybody kept telling me that I needed to fight to get my kids back, and I was like, you know, I don't think that would be smart. I felt like that would be more traumatic for them. And I also had come to believe, after walking in these rooms and watching my higher power work in the lives of everybody else in AA, that eventually my children were going to come home. Um, and I believed that wholeheartedly. There was nothing he could say or do that could change my mind on that, because my higher power had walked me into the rooms. Um, he had walked me through a lot of, of situations. Matter of fact, one was yesterday. Um, from cataract surgeries to uh, almost having car wrecks to having a car wreck and not going to jail. That was yesterday. Um, and I was driving on a suspended license. They didn't take me to jail. <laughs> um, but I believed because I had seen him work throughout my life. And uh, when I walked into these rooms, it solidified it because then my daughter came home and uh, I stayed sober and through all the things that you know happened with teenage girls um, and teenage children in general I did not drink um, and then a year later not even a year yes it was a year and a half later my son walked back in the door and uh, that was pretty amazing um, I remember when they called me and said that he was in DHS custody, and most of y'all would probably think, okay, that's bad. But to me, that was, that was amazing news, um, because then I could see him. Then there was nobody standing in the way of me being able to see my son. Um, 
And then, I mean, he's sitting right here. And it, yeah. <laughs> he's sitting right here in this room with me. Um, today I have two beautiful children, four if you count the two older ones uh -huh. um, and the two younger ones. Today I have, I have spirituality. Um, these last two months, for example, have been extremely hard. Um, it has been up, down, up, down, up, down. And I have not really been able to make meetings because I'll tell you, when I first got into AA, the biggest thing they would tell me is go to meetings, get a sponsor, pray, and read the literature. Okay, well, I'm bad at reading literature because I don't ever really have time. Um, but I do have a sponsor. Matter of fact, I just recently changed my sponsor. Um, I have I have friends that I can call when I'm in need. Um, I have uh, I have family in these rooms, and I have people that hold me accountable in these rooms. Um, I wouldn't be anywhere without them. Well, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for them. Um, I couldn't stop coming to AA for nothing. But these last two months have been very chaotic and during those two months, I have grown spiritually. Um, I have really worked towards my spirituality and praying. Um, and that is the only thing that has kept me sane and sober in some of the times that I've been through. Um, my, my, I hope Brianna doesn't hate me for this. But my daughter went to behavioral health um, in October, and uh, I could have lost her, um, physically lost her from this world. And I am so grateful I did not. And that was a God thing. Um, and I reached out to the people in AA, and I was able to stay sober while my daughter was sick. Um, and when she came home, I was able to love on her instead of somebody else doing it. When she came home, I was able to start helping her with the coping skills that I have learned here in AA. Um, how to pray, how to breathe, how to take it one moment at a time. I mean, these are, these are things... <laughs> These are things that I'm trying to pass on to my children <laughs> um, because they work. They have worked in my life tremendously. Um, and I feel like they could work in their lives and they can work in the newcomer's life. You just got to take it. You got to take it one day at a time. Because um, I, can, I, can, I can think about six months from now. Um, I'll get overwhelmed. I'm great at doing that. Um, I can think about what happened three years ago, um, and I can get overwhelmed. What if? What could I have done to change things? Um, I can't change anything. Uh, but today, I know I can change what's happening in this moment. And my favorite go-to thing is to pray. And it's to call the people that I need to talk to. They keep me grounded. They keep me making the right decisions. Um, I wouldn't be happy and alive and joyous and free had it not been the rooms of AA. God led me to AA, and AA led me to God. And that's all I got.